afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What I'd like to do today is to uh, have a chat about uh, the advantages of uh, digital automation uh, in the aircraft cockpit, uh, which can, which are roughly formed in three areas. Uh, the day-to-day uh, -day routine assistance that the pilots will get, the uh, extra assistance when there are abnormalities, be they uh, pilot generated or aircraft generated, and finally, uh, what assistance he will get, he or she will get, uh, if the aircraft is in grave danger. I suspect today I'll only get uh, through the uh, first issue. So what uh, qualifies me to speak in this area? Uh, my final aircraft was the Boeing 717, which was uh, cobbled together by Boeing in the late 90s by a new build of, tri of the, the Trident proven DC-9 airframe and uh, coupled with a derivation of the avionics which recently had been designed for the uh, P777. So it's avionics and the electrical system. And um, additionally, uh, new and more powerful engines. This automation, to a great extent, uh, manifests itself as um, on the instrumentation within the cockpit. So I'll go through that in some necessary detail, but I'll keep it simple. And also, so that it's meaningful, I'll need to relate it back to 1960s technology. So we'll start off in that general area. But at the very start, a little bit about myself. My uh, career in the air was from 67 to uh, 2012, a 50-50 split between the Air Force and uh, general aviation or commercial aviation. So the aircraft I flew in turn were the Windchill, Empire, Sabre, Mirage, Mackie, CT4 air trainer, and then the uh, Caribou. That's in the Air Force. Uh, when I left the Air Force in 89, I then went to work for Ron McGrath at, at Astral Aviation at Perth Airport, flying a variety of light twins before joining National Jet Systems, an uh, Adelaide-based uh, a charter company, flying the Dash 8, then the 146, and finally the 717. Now, having a look at that um, fine, outstanding example of uh, young manhood there, that was the uh, my Mirage course graduation. You're probably looking at the photos there to see if there's anyone, anyone that might be vaguely uh, resembling anyone that you might know or see. The fellow here is a local boy, uh, John Washington, born and bred in Fremantle, but left in 1966, never to return. Uh, mainly because he um, flew Sabres and then Mirages his whole career without uh, diverting into any other postgraduate area. So um, John, nicknamed George, as in George Washington, uh, went on and uh, was one of only a handful of, of pilots to accrue over 3,000 hours on the Mirage. 3,000 hours might, might, mightn't uh, sound a lot, in general aviation and commercial aviation uh, regime, but um, at an hour of time, uh, pulling a lot of G and going very fast, it's a lot of flying. I'll give you the drum. So let's move on to a good starting point, which is uh, when Jet RPT first came into Australia. This background shot here is a few years later than that, or Jet, Jet RPT came to Australia in the uh, mid-60s. This shot is probably a good 10 years later. There are three giveaways. The tarmac is Tullamarine, which didn't happen until 71. The aircraft uh, shows not only the original DC-9 and 717, but also the stretched, sorry, 727, but also the stretched 727-200, which was a later vintage, and also the aircraft's livery is, I'm guessing, late uh, 70s, early 80s. Now, all, just about all of us here are of an age to have comprehended the, the great advances that Jet RPT, regular public transport, gave us over the earlier turboprops. As a passenger, 
uh, the aircraft, uh, we experienced the aircraft were fast, they were quiet, they were smooth, they didn't vibrate anywhere near as much. Uh, they got up through cloud a lot more quickly in the climb. Most, most likely they were above the cloud rather than bouncing around in it. And um, they, they were less susceptible to turbulence in general. Also, the hostesses, by definition, were female, young and pretty. Yeah, yeah. And additionally, no matter where you sat in the aircraft, be the, 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 the first row or the last, you got a decent feed. So moving to the flight deck, um, all the above applied to the pilots as well. But with nothing else, with no other changes at all, what had increased was the tempo. Whereas previously a sector might have been an hour and a half, it was now an hour, so everything was greatly compressed. But let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the planning considerations, even before the aircraft got off the ground. They roughly fall into three areas. The, the weight of the aircraft, the performance required out of the aircraft, and the power available out of the aircraft. The, uh, the weight of the aircraft, the variables there were the uh, the uh, fuel load and the payload. The performance required was a function really of the, uh, the runway and its physical environments. And the power available was a function of what the aircraft could put out, put out in, given the conditions. The uh, weight of the aircraft, weight and balance in a uh, RPT role that was provided by, to the pilot by a planning cell they bring out a fairly complex uh, flow diagram which had been completed in the F degree but obviously still a requirement by the pilots to double check that. As far as the, um, air, the air fuel characteristics and the aircraft performance were concerned, uh, as far as the um, runway is concerned, runway conditions, uh, an example of uh, a variable there might be the air fuel length. Obviously, if the, if the runway is shorter, the aircraft's got to accelerate more quickly, so it needs a higher power, out, higher power output to achieve that. As far as the uh, capabilities of the aircraft are concerned, unfortunately, jet engines uh, deteriorate away from their <coughs> rated power quite significantly with variations in, in uh, air density, so as the air gets less dense, either due to increasing elevation of the airfield or increasing temperature, you get a lower power output. So they're the, they're the considerations for the actual takeoff when the aircraft is uh, in the, uh, or what's the aircraft going to do then? It's going to um, climb up to a cruise altitude. To determine the uh, cruise altitude available to the aircraft for the given conditions, the pilot's going to have to consider the weight of the aircraft and also the forecast outside air temperature. What height can the aircraft get up to? Because the higher it can go, the more efficient the engines will be. And uh, the early jet engines were not all that efficient, so fuel was critical. The other considerations was uh, were what speed can the aircraft fly at? What safe, what safe speed regime does it have? and uh, it's faced with uh, a very constrained speed on the lab up there, uh, up at cruise altitude, in the context that the maximum speed was limited by the uh, approaching speed of sound, which has implications of drag, etc., etc., etc. So, for example, the aircraft might be flying at a speed through the air, a free stream, Mach number of 0.8, but for the aircraft to generate lift over the wings, that the air has to accelerate. So over the top of the wings, the air is going to be going faster, and hence you want to stay away from those, those compressibility regions. On the bottom end of the scale, you've got the issue with, with um, conventional stall speeds, but the aircraft is now flying in a, uh, a very low air density, and whilst the control surfaces still, still work normally, uh, the momentum of the aircraft is far, is far greater, so the aircraft is less manoeuvrable, and also the 
excess power coming out of the engines is far less. So generally you don't have as precise control of the aircraft at slow speed as you do at lower altitudes. So you've got very restriction, very uh, fundamental restrictions on high speed flight and also on low speed flight. Once again, this was determined by the pilot by checking yet another, uh, yet another uh, flight performance uh, chart or manual. So, so eventually the aircraft uh, gets airborne and this, it's uh, climbing up to its cruise altitude. Apart from the, the normal flying characteristics, the normal flying um, issues faced with the pilot, he's also got to uh, consider the engine management. Engine management in a jet engine is far, more, far simpler than a, in a turboprop or a prop. But um, with the early jet engines, the uh, fuel control unit uh, to the engines was a fairly rudimentary advice, <coughs> device. Uh, the throttles were mechanically linked to the fuel control unit and hence to the, uh, to the engines. And everything else being equal, the um, exhaust, exhaust gas temperatures tended to increase a little bit as you increase altitude. So that's something to consider. Uh, managing your engine so you don't uh, burn them out. So once he gets up to his cruise altitude, uh, how's, he, um, how's he going to navigate the aircraft? As an anal uh, analogy, let me um, bring it back to doing a, a road trip, in the, uh, a long road trip back in the 60s and 70s. There, was, there weren't uh, too much in the way of um, support facilities on long, long distances from A to B and the road signage etc was rather lacking in areas so if you, if you think about it what you used to do was to call up your um, your motorist organisation and they would provide you with a, a route map of where you were going which, was, <laughs> which would give you uh, distances, towns uh, fuel facilities, accommodation, maybe meals, that sort of thing. So you then have to plan ahead uh, using the uh, little information that you did have to get yourself from A to B in a uh, the way that you would like. Likewise, um, as far as um, long distance flying was concerned back in those days, um, Air traffic control radar wasn't, was of very little use uh, to the pilots because there, was, there were radar facilities in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide uh, based on primary uh, radar, which was a pulse went out from the transmission facility to the aircraft, bounced off the aircraft and back again. So that signal was quite attenuated over distance, so range was limited and also the signal was attenuated by cloud, so it would paint a cloud return far more readily than an aircraft return. So radar wasn't, was not of any use. So he, re he relied on ground navigation aids, which back in those days were quite limited as well. The most common one was a non-directional beacon which, which pointed to where the beacon was uh, on the ground. That signal was attenuated by weather conditions, so it would wander around a fair amount, and so it just gave you a general guidance, um, and that was all. And it was only of any use if you were aiming, endeavouring to track directly towards it or away from it. There were fewer examples of um, VOR in, in uh, VOR DME or Omni which gave you a fairly fairly constant bearing out to about 150 miles at high level and if it was if it was uh, co-located with a distance measuring equipment or well, then you could get and you're tracking to or from you could get a precise pinpoint over the ground if you had a pinpoint you could then update where you are, uh, you could go through a range of calculations to determine what the wind, the actual wind was that was affecting the aircraft and how that varied with your, your forecast wind and to work 
to work all that out. The captain relied on his brain power and one of these things, which a lot of you would have seen in the past, a uh, aviation derivation of a slide rule. So having updated himself on his, on his wings and his ground speed and so on and so forth, he's then going to look at his fuel more closely to see whether that's going to get him where he, where he wants to go. And so there's lots of sitting on the edge of the seat, uh, as it were, to um, hopefully get yourself safe, safely to destination. And I believe on the, on the long haul across the Nullarbor to Perth, it was not unusual uh, for an aircraft to have to descend into Kalgoorlie to pick up a little bit of a little bit of extra gas to get itself onwards to its destination. To determine um, his descent, it's not just a matter of looking out ahead and saying, "I oh, will start the descent about now." A, a, a general descent point was about 100 miles out, but that required a lot of um, simple, uh, but nevertheless, computation on. Okay, how far we've got to go, what runway are we likely to use, what track miles, what other limits might there be, and then come up with a little subroutine, which you'd have to keep running your head all the way, through, all the way down the descent to keep, uh, to keep yourself above limiting air traffic control steps and so on. Finally, we get, get down to, uh, to the approach area, and now the aircraft, and now the, cat, now the crew are flying a, a very slippery machine. Sure, there are speed brakes to slow you down, but uh, they have varying levels of efficiency. The, um, the 146 had a very efficient speed brake, which worked down to low indicated air speeds quite well, because it was designed for short, uh, sh short landing situation. The uh, DC-9, 717, didn't have anywhere near as, as efficient as speed brake, so if you didn't organise your deceleration in a timely manner, you could get caught out with uh, being too fast, too close in. <coughs> Finally, we get to the landing stage and now we're in a situation where we're landing an aircraft about 30% faster than what's the case with a straight wing turboprop, whatever. So it was um, not a particularly easy job uh, flying the very early uh, T-Jets. And how did the uh, pilots put it all together themselves? Well, this is what they had to interact with in the, co on the, uh, in the cockpit, on the flight deck. And what is shown there is that there was basically a, a discrete uh, sensor or instrument for each and every uh, sensor that there was in the cockpit. There was very little integration of systems. This is a bit tired, this uh, photo, but it's the, it's the best I could uh, come across of an original DC-930, as would have been supplied to uh, ANSET and TAA. Middle section there, there's a blank, and I suspect that that's where the aircraft, aircraft's radar was, uh, which was similar in capabilities to the air traffic control radar, and that it, it painted weather, which is what you wanted it for, but it didn't paint it all that well. One thing I will point out for uh, a little bit uh, later discussion is the primary attitude indicator here. Notice there are a few off flags associated with that. More on that in a minute or two. So let's fast forward 30, 35 years. Just digressing slightly. The more tech savvy of you probably have, your, your only computer is probably a uh, laptop very smart laptop which you take with you anywhere anywhere you go in the world and uh, maybe you've got a wireless link back to a printer at home but most of you uh, I imagine still have a conventional computer in an office or an office space and most of us would have monitor or most of us would have one monitor a couple might have two in this office there are six big monitors uh, arrayed across across the instrument panel. You would have a key. You would probably have a conventional keyboard, and the main part of the keyboard are the uh, are the QWERTY, QWERTY alpha and numerics. And what we have here, not shown all that well, are two keyboards on which all the 
operational information for a particular route or sector can be inserted. So the, the, the flight plan route, the altitude, the uh, forecast winds and temperatures, and the aircraft weights. Up above the top of your QWERTIES, you've got uh, some function keys, uh, which determines the format of what is displayed on, the, on your monitors. And across the top here, both on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, are the equivalent of your function keys. And finally, you've got, you've got, you've got your mouse, which drives your cursor, which, which um, determines the way you manipulate what is on your screens. And that is done by the central section of the knobs through there. So, is it, a big, is it a big flying computer? The answer is yes. If we, can t if we compare the two side by side, it's uh, fairly obvious uh, which is the uh, less confronting, regardless of any knowledge at all of aviation. So, moving on to the, to the beast itself. 717 on the tarmac at uh, Newman, which was one of the most demanding airfields in the in the um, RBT environment in Western Australia in that it's over 1,700 feet above sea level and when the wind does blow there it's invariably directly across the strip so there's no, no adv advantage, uh, advantage from a headwind component. 717 looks remarkably similar to a DC-930 which Ansett and TAA have uh, because it's essentially the same air airframe. The only Differences being the, uh, the uh, bigger, fatter engines with a higher bypass rate ratio. Uh, the DC 930s, their rated power output, which was in icy conditions, which is at sea level 15 degrees Celsius, was 14,500 pounds. This one had a, a standard output at 18,500 pounds. And right at the top of the vertical stabiliser, doesn't show all, all that well on this picky, but it's, it's a little bit, little bit knobbly, unlike the smooth airfoil section of the DC-9, because there was a, a beef, beefed up worm drive for the, uh, for the all-moving tailplane. Now when we talk about automation, probably the first thing we think of is an autopilot. Would you believe I went all the way through my Air Force career without coming across an autopilot once. That's probably understandable in, um, in high performance, uh, short duration aircraft, short endurance aircraft, but not even the Caribou had a autopilot, which is not strictly correct because he had a, had a default one called the Lone Master, <coughs> the guy who looked after all the, uh, the freight and passengers down the back. He, uh, or most of them, got a little bit of ad hoc instruction on the effects of controls and how to uh, keep an aircraft in straight, straight on level flight. So my first introduction to an autopilot was when I came to an astral aviation and I was doing some endorsement work with Ron McGrath in, a, in the mighty uh, Duchess, uh, P-76 Duchess, Alpha Hotel Yankee, and we were motoring along from A to B at one stage and Ron said flick, flick that master switch and flick those two rocker switches now take your hands off and I said wow geez it's flying by itself <laughs> and I said to him in, in, all, in all honesty how, how do we go about logging this and he said what do you mean I said well surely we can't log this I mean we're not flying the aircraft I mean it's doing it itself he says yes but who's in charge of the autopilot so I said okay okay so I'll, I'll log it now, with the, um, with the previous slot of the uh, picture of the uh, DC-9 instrument panel, I, I mentioned the, uh, the off-lags associated with the, with the uh, altitude indicator. One of those off-lags would have been associated with the flight director. Now, an autopilot is, is, only as, is only as capable as the information being, being presented to it. The Duchess would simply maintain a height lock or a heading lock or a VOR track, but if you have a flight director, there's a lot more, it allows you to present a lot more information uh, to the autopilot itself. So the DC-9 would have had um, uh, various 
other functions that you could feed into the, into the autopilot system by the flight director, a, uh, an altitude, a, a speed control, various other things. But this really came to its, to its, uh, to its, to its full fruition in the 717 where throughout the, uh, the full regime of uh, situations the aircraft might find itself in, there are only two circumstances where you could not have the autopilot engaged. And that was if you're, if you're being commanded to get away from um, threatening terrain, and also if you're being given directions on how to avoid other traffic in the air uh, through the uh, uh, traffic collision avoidance system. Any other time you could have the flight director and the autopilot engaged. In addition to the autopilot, the aircraft also has an auto, an auto throttle system by virtue of the fact that in the, um, in the 717, at the bottom of the throttle levers, there's a Analog, analog to digital converter, and then the the throttle throttle positions are digitally sent to the uh, fuel control unit, and then to the engines. And because that there's that digital link, you can now feed into the, the whole mechanism, the complete mechanism, the ambient conditions that the aircraft is is experiencing at the time, the uh, the pressures, the temperatures not only through to the, to the auto throttle, so you don't have to manipulate the auto throttle at all, but that can be fed through to all of the other parameters throughout the aircraft to make it essentially a, a hands-off operation. Very, very quickly, apart from auto, auto pilot, auto throttle, auto spoilers or speed brakes, which would deploy automatically if you abort the takeoff uh, or on landing when you select reverse thrust, Auto brakes, three levels, low, medium and high. Why auto brakes? Because they do a smoother job at decelerating the aircraft than, than does old blocks. Auto pressurisation, you fed all that, uh, you've put all that in the system to start with, so you don't have another gauge you've got to manipulate with. Auto engine sync, you don't have to fiddle around with the throttles to get the engines balanced. And even auto nav aid tuning. The aircraft knows where it is the whole time. If you do have a VOR or a DME up ahead, it'll automatically turn that for you. So I'll now move ahead and we'll simply talk about the, um, the, the, the general assistance that the pilot will have on the flight deck. Forget about all the numbers to start with. Uh, in the middle, we've got a, a large attitude indicator. Below that, we've got the uh, business end of the head heading reference system. We have a, a vertical speed indicator here, then an altitude readout, and then a speed readout. And up, up the top here are the, are the uh, parameters that the system, the flight management system, has the aircraft out to achieve at that particular time. So the aircraft is, there's the horizon, uh, there's the uh, pitch altitude point of the, of, the, of the aircraft, about two and a half degrees up, two and a half degrees angle of attack, and there's the flight director, co coincident with the aircraft uh, goal wing pitch. So level flight at uh, 35,000 feet. The VSI is not showing anything, so it's in level flight. We've got a heading, Read out down here, uh, a, tr a tracking index. The little magenta dot there is the command of speed. The aircraft isn't quite out at the moment. <coughs> That's its maximum speed limit. So it's only a few knots above the command of speed. And there's its minimum speed for the conditions. So all visually presented to the pilot as a fait accompli. No requirement to look at boring performance manuals, anything like that, it's all there. Time that previous uh, picture in with the navigation display. Uh, the uh, flight management track that the aircraft is on. Um, 
and that's an 80 mile ring range, a range ring there, so that's one 60 miles ahead. It's just past overhead Alice Springs, that's the next waypoint on the way through to Cairns. Notice we have a track up the top here, that's what the aircraft's tracking, as opposed to a heading reference down there. That's, that's an airport function there, and we have an elapsed time and a UTC time, or GMT time, and the we have up here, we've got ground, ground speed, true airspeed, and a, a wind vector. So all that manipulation the pilot would have, would have to have done previously, it's all there presented to him as a fait accompli. Makes the, the workload within the cockpit far, far, far easier. This one's a slightly different a picture of a nav display. The aircraft is off the flight plan track, um, so it's, it's in a, uh, a track mode. Uh, it's displaced 16 degrees left of its flight plan track. And why have we done that? To avoid weather. Very good weather radar returns, colour coded, and red obviously means danger, so you stay, stay away from danger. Uh, upwind if you can, upwind of big uh, cumulonimbus clouds and the wind vector is, is lying in that orientation there. So I've turned the aircraft to uh, manoeuvre, that's Mount Magnet, Megafera, to manoeuvre upwind of that cumulonimbus cloud there. And just out of interest, that's an aircraft uh, 2,000 feet below our aircraft at minus 2.0 is uh, in hundreds of feet, so it's, uh, I think we're, over, we're overtaking that. Uh, and that's been presented on the traffic collision avoidance system. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll call it quits at that stage, and if I'm invited back at a, at a later stage, I'll talk about the, the other abnormal and um, uh, critical situations that the aircraft could possibly be in. Well done. <laughs>